this is Jennifer Donna with YoungFemaleEntrepreneurs.com and you're watching YFD TV hosted here every Thursday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern in the Ovalai.tv studio. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Ovalai. Ovalai, where we provide you with, or we empower you, <laughs> your home office lifestyle through web hosting, cloud services, and domain names. Visit Ovalai.com to buy your domain today. And by audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com slash Ovaline. Over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So like I was saying before we talked about our sponsors, uh, this is Jennifer, or I'm Jennifer Donna. I don't think I said that. I'm getting a little mixed up today. My name is Jennifer Donna. I'm the director of YoungFemaleEntrepreneurs.com, and I'm also your host for this evening's live stream. Uh, you're watching Young Female Entrepreneurs. Like I said, it's every Thursday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern. Tonight's guest is Jennifer Rooting of DocRun.com. It's a brand new company. Well, I say brand new in that it was, I believe it's in beta right now, or maybe it's just gone public. I'll have to talk a little bit more with Jennifer about that. Um, but it's been in the works for a while. She started her entrepreneurial journey when she was 17 years old. 17. We interviewed Tori Mulner a, a while ago, um, who's a 15 year old entrepreneur. So it'd be fun to hear. Um, it's going to, it's going to be fun to hear uh, Jennifer's experience with entrepreneurship. But before we welcome her on the show, I wanted to fill you in on a little bit of um, what's happening in uh, as far as YFE goes. We've got YFE LA that happened last week where there was 40 women. It was a sold out event. It was nice and intimate, cozy experience um, at Border Grill in Los Angeles. Huge thank you to Border Grill because they were fantastic hosts. Erin of WellInLA.com. She's our YFE at Los Angeles City Coordinator, and she did an amazing job. This was actually my first Los Angeles experience. I'm up in the Seattle area running Young Female Entrepreneurs, um, but I flew down to meet all of the women that showed up for that event. A lot of them show up to our Twitter chat, so I felt like I had already met them uh you know, before I had met them online, but it just was a nice like icebreaker. Um, just going into a room and actually really knowing these people. So, anyway, Aaron did a fantastic job, and the speakers were amazing, really amazing. If you haven't watched last week's live stream, it was all about the Los Angeles area and the women that spoke at that event. So make sure that you check it out. It's episode twenty eight, and it's on iTunes, on Overlay TV, and of course on Young Female Entrepreneurs, and. Here you see Nyla, and there is uh, Donna, too. There were two speakers that spoke together, and it was interesting. We're going to have to talk to Jennifer about this. They have a joint venture. Um, they've both kind of come together. They each own their own company, that, but they've come together to create a program. So, And I know a lot of young female entrepreneurs do that, where they leverage their eat their own communities, um, their own audience, and come together to create one product that uh, brings together both of their expertises. Their ex expertise? That's one word, right? Expertise. expertise. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know I'm really impressing everyone that's watching the live stream tonight. Uh, so anyway, uh, they bring together both of it. And I think it'll be interesting to talk about joint ventureship and how that works out as far as um, legal documents, contracts, and all that fun stuff go. And how DocRun.com is going to be able to help us out with that. But apart from that, um, we had a YouTube vlogger who was absolutely amazing. She talked a little bit about... Um, she's at LuxLife.com. She talked a little bit about how to grow an audience and how to hustle and how to go out and pitch pieces and how what I thought was really fun was there, there was a number of lifestyle bloggers there and people that were kind of doing more of a solopreneur piece and they identified themselves as an entrepreneur, which was very interesting for me because in the Seattle area, I kind of have to almost pull people's arms to see themselves as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, when you're off on your solo thing and you're only thinking about like, oh, I just want to bring in a couple thousand dollars this month. So anyway, it was just an interesting experience. It was awesome. Absolutely loved it. I do want to remind you that I am on the live stream chat. If you're just showing up now, this is the Young Female Entrepreneurs live stream that happens every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern. Jennifer Rooting is on our um, program tonight of DocRun.com. And make sure that you ask her questions because she has a number of businesses. She started off when she was 17 years old, and she now runs a company that helps you for, well, actually, she has for a number of years, but this company now utilizes a technology to help uh, basically move the move uh, the experience that you have one-on-one -on -one with a, an attorney or a lawyer into a um, a much more affordable environment. So she's bringing, I think what I've heard her say um, in the past is that she's really bringing the law to the people which I thought was an awesome an awesome way to think about it. So 
Again, I'm going to be very excited to talk to her. Just wanted to mention one more um, piece about the YFELA piece uh, event before I moved on to the next thing is that um, the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. Huge thank you to them, Spe- specifically the PR and uh, marketing director there, Kendra. She was amazing. She gave us a room in a uh, Shishi Noodle Bar. Huge thank you to her. Great space. And then as far as... Um, What's happened past Los Angeles? Next Friday, CNN International is partnering with young female entrepreneurs on our YFE chat. This is huge. So their leading women segment, um, their series there, the team behind that, the producers behind leading women are going to be on our YFE chat on Twitter next Friday. Make sure that you add it to your calendars. It's 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 Eastern. So it's a late night Friday chat. It's a lot of fun. They're always very popular. Um, But CNN is going to be running a piece on young female entrepreneurs, and they're going to be um, really uh, in there and discussing, learning more about the community. And it's going to be an awesome topic because it's talking about Hannah um, Rosen. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I watched an interview from her recently. Her new book called uh, The End of Men. It's going to be a very interesting chat. So (laughs) next Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 Eastern, add it to your calendar. And every day leading up to that event, we're doing a big Instagram fest. And I know that Jennifer is on Instagram because I stalked her on Twitter. So we're going to have to talk to her about Instagram and seeing how she can participate in this. But it's basically meeting one another on Instagram by sharing a photo, uh, tagging it with the hashtag for the day. And that way we can get to know one another and really see the possibilities of what you what's possible through entrepreneurship as a young female. So it's not just, you know, sitting at your home office. We're going to really see exactly what you guys are doing on a day-to-day day-to-day basis. What? Your TV. My TV? Behind you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry guys. So I'm talking to my producer and he said I messed it up. So YFE TV is the hashtag for this evening. So if you have questions for Jennifer, make sure that you ha- uh, chat them in. I like I said I am on the chat. But let's go ahead and introduce our guest in cuz I know that I've talked for what like 10 minutes or something like that. Sorry about that. Um we have a lot going on at youngfemaleentrepreneurs.com, so make sure that you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. So, without further ado, Jennifer, she is a nationally renowned renowned expert on small businesses and corporate structuring. A serial entrepreneur at 17, she founded Incorp.com, what is now the largest registered agent service provider in the U.S., and later MyLLC.com, a business entity formation service, and the ones following. She is also author of the best-selling Limited Liability Companies for Dummies. I bet I bet a lot of you have that book in your office. And an active public speaker and consultant. She's working to disrupt the legal field with her most recent venture, DocRun.com, an innovative software solution that creates highly customized legal documents for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Whew, that was a pretty lengthy uh, bio. Welcome onto the show, Jennifer. Hi, thank you for having me. So why don't we go ahead and get started and just talk a little bit about what Doc Run exactly is. When I mean, because, all right, before I preface this, we're just going to go ahead and get this question out of the way. So Doc Run, we talked about disrupting the legal, I think you said exactly, um, disrupting the legal, disrupting the legal field with um, Doc Run. So we've got Legal Zoom out here. We've got Rocket Lawyer, which I know a lot of women are familiar with from, like, conferences like um, Tori Johnson, Spark and Hustle, and things like that. So where does Doc Run fit when compared to those services? Well, uh, LegalZoom actually, you know, LegalZoom is very similar to my company, my LLC, where we handle the formations. And, you know, the thing is, is that when I was writing the second edition of LLCs for Dummies, I wanted to come up with an alternative, a solution for creating an operating agreement because a lot of LLCs are by far the most popular entity and um, they're incredibly flexible. There's so much that you can do with them. You can structure the management however you want, you can structure the ownership. Uh, What people don't realize is with great power comes great responsibility and so they would just form their LLC at a company like mine or LegalZoom and they would get their form, their filed articles in the mail and then that would be it. They would, you know, essentially think that they were covered. And uh, in essence, they're not. You know, in some states, if you don't have an operating agreement or even a certain provision in your operating agreement, your whole LLC is invalid. So um, that sort of brought a, another issue about, which is, okay, well, 
what do you do after you get your articles in the mail? You know, say a very common scenario is two partners are coming together to start a bakery or, or any sort of business really. And commonly one will have a little bit more money they can invest than the other. And perhaps that person wants to get some of that money back before the profits are split. You know, you can do that with an LLC. It's very powerful in that way. Um, but how do you structure your operating agreement like that? And, and also abide by state laws because every state is different in how, you know, what you're allowed to do. And so um, Rocket Lawyer does have a, a solution for that. LegalZoom just has fill in the blank forms. That's not viable. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of these other competitors, what they tried to do is they tried to take something that was a non-viable solution for, you know, do-it-yourself legal, which is fill in the blank forms. Fill in the blank forms generally aren't state specific. Um, they don't allow a level, a deep level of customization. And, you know, a lot of these companies try to just say, okay, what we'll do is we'll ask you the questions and then we'll fill in the form for you. So they're simplifying a process that's inherently broken. Um, what we look to do is how can we replicate the attorney process? You know, attorneys, when you, when you go to a lawyer, they, they'll charge you $1,500 or maybe a $5,000 retainer for an operating agreement. And in actuality, what they're doing is they're asking you questions, gathering information gathering data, and then they're using that data um, to pick and choose the relevant provisions and do, you know, some stuff in a Word document. That probably takes them about 10 minutes, maybe a half an hour, and then they bill you for a lot more than that. So <laughs> that, that, you know, it's extremely intricate, um, but it also is it lends itself to being automated with artificial intelligence. So that's what we're working on. All right, so you talk about lawyers a lot um, when you're talking about doc stock, obviously with legal documents, but you don't actually have a law background other than the experience that you've gathered, right? Over the last, how many years is that, 15 years? No, I don't. Actually, I was going to go to law school, and then I ended up dropping out of school and using my scholarship money to start my first business, and that was it was all over after that. Um, no, I think that's an awesome story, but what, so you went to, it was more of an art school, right? My high school was oh, high school. school. Yeah, so I went to a performing arts high school. It was a lot like Glee. Not <laughs> <a school. laughs> um, you know, it was. Uh, sorry, my monitor just turned off. Hold on. Um, it was no, it was, it was good. It was really good. Actually, it was academically, it was a wonderful school. It was one of the best in the nation. So growing up, growing up in Vegas, um, it was the best alternative to not going to a public school. So. so you grew up doing more of a creative type of a thing, and I know a lot of young female entrepreneurs are in the same space where they even, they graduated with a liberal arts major, they are kind of in foo-foo land, thinking about high, and real, like more creative type of uh, individuals. So uh, what, how, would, how would you recommend that these women break into a space like what you've broken into? Uh, maybe explain a little bit about your background behind how you started at 17 and got into this world where I, I mean, I just heard the Rocket Lawyer uh, CEO and founder speak, and he has a crazy law background. I mean, he was a high power attorney, you know, the kind of guy that you love to hate. Um, so anyway, I just, I love your story. So maybe tell us a little bit about how you were able to break into that world. Um, you well, first of all, I think it's knowledge. You know, knowledge is free. It's pretty easy to attain. Um, so it wasn't, you know, I just happened to develop a passion for it, strangely. Uh, I always think people should follow their passion. So if they are doing liberal arts stuff and they are the creative types, I mean, they should do something that really suits them, you know. Um, I, my company was just, a, it was part of me. So as it evolved, it would have evolved to whatever my interests were, you know, as like a self-centered <laughs> teenager. Um, and I happened to really enjoy the process of, you know, doing like some complex corporate structuring. And what I would do is we get these customers, these clients, and I would bring in the best lawyers and um, sit in on those meetings and just argue, you know, and try <laughs> to see different sides of it. And in the process of, um, you know, of doing that over a number of years, you just start to become proficient in a very, you know, small space. When you go to law school, you are taught how to think. 
you're not really taught how to do contracts. They don't, you know, uh, we hire a lot of lawyers here and none of them took any classes on how to draft a contract um, or a business agreement. Um, so that specific knowledge they would have to attain anyway. So, you know, and I go to the same CLE courses that they do and it's really just a matter of um, gaining an understanding of a field and being passionate about it. Okay. So now as far as, um, so you have to follow your passion and really just, like you said, knowledge is free. But as far as uh, being 17 years old and helping companies form LLCs or incorporate whatever it was, um, you said in the interview recently with Google that you did a lot of faking it till you make it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Which I think we hear a lot of women that are very successful say that. <laughs> okay, so what are some examples of faking it till you make it that you did? Um, confidence, you know, uh, you, you have to just fake confidence. You pretend like you know what you're doing and um, be really good at making sure nobody finds out that you have no idea what you're doing when you're that young. Um, and just, you know, trying to pick up and learn quickly. Um, I faked my age all the time. Nobody knew how old I was. <laughs> so whenever we have office birthday parties, it was always like my sweet 16, you know, joke party every year. Um, and I'm trying to think of some specific examples. I think everything, when you try it for the first time, I tend to try to fake it till I make it, you know? Um, even raising capital, you have to pretend, you have to go out there like you're an old pro, you know what you're doing. And, um, you know, when you trip and fall, just correct yourself really quickly, so. Okay, well, let's go ahead and jump forward then. I wasn't gonna ask this question until later, but as far as raising capital goes, you talk about, again, in the Google interview, that you decided you wanted to be off on your own, not have a team, go try and raise capital off by yourself. Now, you don't necessarily have a technical background, right? You just, you really did work within forming these, uh, you know, doing, drafting up contracts and, like you said, documents for these small businesses and larger businesses. So how was it that you, what was that process like, pitching investors? Um, you know, that was, well, the process of pitching investors, I have a track record, so it, it makes it really easy um, to raise capital. Some investors were a little bit sketchy about me not having a technical co-founder or a tech partner, and um, they should have been, frankly. It, it's actually, I wish that I would have <laughs> had one because, you know, I don't, I wouldn't have had to deal with the learning curve. It's probably cost us a couple of months um, in the development of the, of the artificial intelligence. And, but I did, my reasoning for going it alone was more, um, it, I'm a little strong headed sometimes. And somebody said to me, nobody would invest in a single female founder. And I was like, you know, I'll show you. But, <laughs> I, I just, I feel like I had the track record to do it. And, um, I see a lot of issues. I see a lot of companies that fall apart. I have, you know, being in the tech world, I have a lot of friends that are entrepreneurs. And one of the big components are partners, you know? And I didn't have anyone that I'd known for a long time and trusted. I mean, it really is like a marriage. And I wasn't comfortable, you know, because I was investing so much of my personal money into it and um, I could raise capital on my own. I wasn't comfortable, you know, locking myself into a relationship that I couldn't necessarily get out of easily. Um, and so what I ended up doing is just hiring people, you know? All right. So you, you said that, you know, you were comfortable going up to these people and asking, how, how did that connection come? Because I mean, some of the, the people that invested in Doc Run are very, I mean, they're all impressive. They're all very impressive investors. How did you make that first connection with them? Were these people that you had warm, like warm leads to, or was it you basically getting in touch with them by jumping out of them when they like go to their car? What did that look like? <laughs> um, you know, a lot of it has to do with your network. 
You know, it's um, pretty quickly, I, when I knew I wanted to do a startup and I knew I wanted to raise capital, it was, uh, it was kind of an experience that I wanted to, to do. Um, I'm a bootstrapper by nature, so it was a little bit awkward going out and like asking for money when I've never taken any money with my other companies. Um, but I just dove into the tech world and it's surprisingly easy being a girl um, because people want you at their events. They, you know, they give you more attention and, you know, while it's, um, you know, you're on more of a platform that you can sort of hang yourself with, like they're, you know, they're looking at you a little bit more closely than they would a guy, you, it's also easier for you to make connections. Um, investors genuinely do want to invest in women. It's just really hard for them to to find things that they can really go back to their limited partners and say, yeah, these are the clear-cut reasons of why I made the investment. Um, so I, you know, a lot of them were friends. You know, I find key people that have a lot of connections and get them to put their weight behind me. And um, and they did, you know, and I, I, I'm very, very appreciative because they're, they're the ones who make it happen. All right. So for and there's I know a number of young female entrepreneurs that are that have been pitching people. I think they're on to their 50th person that they've been pitching um, and they're still trying to get going. Do you have a tip for them? I mean, you obviously have been in this since you were 17 years old. So you've had time to develop a network and develop um, these relationships, whereas these women are just getting into it. Do you have a tip apart from kind of a proven track record? on ways to approach a pitch to get to be like remembered or to come away feeling a little bit better? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'm, um, I'm very, very different at raising capital than most people are. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily the right way. Um, but when I meet with investors, I tend to not talk about raising capital. <laughs> Um, I tend to not even talk about my business at all in the beginning. Um, I love going to places like South by Southwest and you go to some parties and you start talking to people. Um, I've always found it a value to kind of get to know the person um, and get to know them on a personal level first and just kind of dive in and see what they're like. Because that's, that's really important too, you know, to, to break down those facades and see like, do I like this person? Do I want to hang out with this person? Um, because your investors become your partners essentially. Um, and then, you know, also to raise capital when you don't really need it. Um, so it's much easier to be like, yeah, yeah, I have this going on, I have that going on, all this, you know, all this stuff is happening. And then have them be the one to say, oh, well, maybe we should talk. Or are you raising capital? Or um, because it's just human nature. It's like if you're dating, <laughs> you know, I tend to, as I associate a lot of things with dating, actually, um, it's funny, but it, it is, it is very similar, you know, it's, um, yeah, you have to play, it's not playing hard to get as much as you just want them to be the one to initiate the topic. No, I think that's some great tips. Now, you've talked about how women need to be more, to think more on a, a bigger level. They need to be more disruptive, like you've uh, kind of set your mission to do. Now, what do you, what do you feel like the difference is between you that goes out and you create this company that's trying to disrupt an entire industry, you know, something that's had very long stance of a one-on-one -on -one relationship that it needs to cost a lot of money and then there's a high barrier to entry versus someone that says, I'm going to start a business and it's going to just be me. So what do you th feel like your the key differentiator there is between your way of thinking and their way, way of thinking? Um, I think it has to do with uh, tolerance for fear. Um, and also, I've, <laughs> I've never really seen my limitations. Um, in my mind, I don't have any limitations. I think that's a, that's a big key differentiator. You know, um, when I talk to people, it kills me when they say, oh, I can't do that. It's like, what do you mean you can't do that? I'm doing it. And we have the same mental faculties. You're obviously clearly intelligent. Um, what is really the only thing that's holding them back are their core beliefs. And I think at the end of the day, getting in touch with your core beliefs and saying, okay, well, what do I really have to lose? You know, you don't really have a lot to lose and, and the sky is the limit. And just really um, trusting yourself to work it out. You know, when the shit 
hits and the stuff hits the fan and it never fall <laughs> over and over again, um, you're going to work it out. You're going to fix it. You're going to figure it out. It doesn't matter if you have a good cry first. It doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, you're going to be fine. And you just have to know that, you know. Um, and, you know, everything can collapse. And at the end of the day, you'll still be able to work it out and just having that faith in yourself and, and not and not budging on it ever. Well, I really liked I you've said I just I really did fall in love with you when I was watching the Google video. I'll have to make sure that I post a link to that too because you talked about being comfortable feeling uncomfortable basically. And I think that's a key differentiator there between you and another person that I've met recently. Whereas you have said, you know, you've been in experiences where you're in a strange country and you've had a strange, you know, whatever happen and you've kind of almost equated that to business and how there's some stuff that just happens and it sucks, but you move on. Now, um, as far as and you were talking about this in, in terms of failure um, and how you need to embrace it. And then at the end of the day, it's, it makes for the best stories. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, do you have any awesome best stories that you want to tell us as far as failure goes? <laughs> Just to make some people feel a little bit better, I guess, about themselves. Um, well, real quick, just like to give you the genesis of that whole concept of just being super comfortable um, in that space of the unknown. It's, it's actually arose <laughs> when I was uh, in my early 20s. I was the worst at dating. Like if a guy didn't call me back, I'd be like, what the hell am I, what's going on? Because I'm like, you know, it was just like, oh. And so finally, one of my older, more wiser friends took me aside and he was like, Jen, you know that place where you don't know if they like you back and you're like, you, you're excited and it's nervous and you're like, you're, you know, he's like, that's, you need to learn to embrace that because you only have that once and that's where the gold is. As soon as you learn to embrace it, um, it will transform everything. And it took me a while to embrace that in my dating life, but in my business life, it clicked. I was like, wow, that, that makes so much sense. And so I, um, I applied it pretty immediately to uh, business. And it's really just learning to love that feeling of a little bit of chaos. You, you, you don't know what you're doing. You know? you're, you're faking it till you make it. Um, and just saying yes all the time. and. Um, you know, it's it's really been a good thing for me. It's you know, I think that's a big key to success is you know learning to embrace that that feeling of awkwardness. And as for um, moments of failure, oh my gosh, I've had so many bad ones. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't even know if I want to admit them. <laughs> Actually, uh, I kind of want to sweep them under the rug because there's some really embarrassing moments. Um, but yeah, recently I had a pitch meeting with an investor and everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. It was bad. Like the night before I was redoing our deck completely um, and it was very you know, like an exhaustive process. My designer stayed up really late, you know, throwing in graphics here and there. And then I wake up the next morning and the whole file was gone. So I had to put it together really quickly. I got the time mixed up in my calendar. So I thought it was like at 3 p.m. It turns out I get a call at 2.15 where I'm like just preparing for the last stuff, like trying to actually work on the pitch. And they're like, you know, it's a full partner meeting. So all the partners are sitting there and they're like, where are you? I'm like, crap. So I like run down to the, I run to the meeting, I get to the meeting, super flustered, bomb it royally, like royally bomb it. And uh, it was so bad. <laughs> it was just sobering, you know. And um, at the end of the day, there was no one to blame but myself, you know. So I had to I had to take that one and, and, you know, luckily when it comes to investors, once you show traction, like all that stuff's forgotten. Uh, but I definitely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody tells you like the great stories of when you go in there and you kill it. And I've had those moments that are, you know, they're epic. Um, but there's also the ones where it's just like, are you serious? And this are raining on the way to the meeting. So I come in, I'm like drenched. <laughs> That's awesome. So 
All right, so I have two more questions. One I hadn't really planned on speaking about. Now, you don't have to answer this, but this is a question that comes up a lot because there's a number of women that are near, you know, they're not nearly as busy as you are, as taking on as much risk, but they've told me, you know, unfortunately with the business, a dating is totally off the plate. I'm not even going to look at it. And you've talked a number of times about being a single young female entrepreneur and how that makes investors a little weary, especially when you're working with employees and you've got people that are much older than you, people that are much more experienced. Is dating something that you're considering now? Are you dating? Is that something that you're just like, I seriously don't have time? Um, I was dating and then I, it wasn't a good breakup and it did distract me. So now I've decided I'm not dating, (laughs) you know, um, I went through the whole, like, I'm just, you know, um, so, you know, it is a distraction at the end of, you know, like we don't want it to be, but on the other side of the flip side of the coin, you know, life is your, you know, what I regret to some extent is, you know, I'm 29 now. And everybody's like, oh, you succeeded and accomplished so much. And you know what I didn't accomplish? I didn't accomplish being a 20 year old, (laughs) you know? Um, I didn't accomplish, you know, actually being young and having a great social life. And um, so I, you know, because all of the listeners or the viewers are younger, I encourage you to please, like, don't waste your 20s, find some balance. You know, even as hungry as you are, like everything will work out. Everything will come in time. Um, but do find some balance, you know, unless you're like me and you're like burned and you don't want to date right now. But, um, you know, part of that is, you know, I, I do think that um, you do need to make time for it because then you're going to be that bitter, you know, woman in your early 30s, <laughs> you know, is hearing the top of the clock ticking and, you know, has no prospects and really dating is a process. I mean, the whole dating is, is really, it allows you to find what you want and find what you like. I mean, it's, um, it's an important process I think people go through. So you don't want to end up 35 and not having gone through that process and like going on match.com and like rushing into something. So, you know, I'm, I'm all about work-life balance, even in your twenties. I think that's interesting. I think a lot of people appreciate you saying that. So I feel like a lot of them are in your same shoes. Now, my last question is, as far as Santa Monica goes, um, because your offices are out of there. Now, I've seen a number of Instagram photos, which I would love if you would participate in our Instagram stuff so people can see what it looks like to run a company like DocRun.com. I'll have to tell you more about it afterwards. But um, so Santa Monica, you're there with um, your team. And are you you said you're originally from Las Vegas, right? Yeah, well, I, I was born in Phoenix, and then all of the like really important formative years, my parents decided to raise me in Las Vegas. <laughs> all right, so Santa Monica, the move there, is that because of Doc Run, or is that just a personal choice to, to be living there? Um, so I moved to the west side of L.A. from um, the Hollywood Hills area about a year ago, specifically because I knew I wanted to start Doc Run, um, maybe even a year and a half ago. And oh, this is more the tech center is over here. And um, I regret not having done it sooner. You know, I bike to my meetings every day. Like we go have our like office stuff on the beach, playing volleyball. Um, the lifestyle is so much younger and it's just, um, it's make, I'm, I'm having that moment where I'm like, ah, God, I wish I was here when I was 26, you know, 25. So, um, but I'm happy I'm here now. It's, it's, it's amazing. All right. So on that note, where are there any events or um, places or fun stuff that someone that lives in Santa Monica should check out if they're young, female, and entrepreneurial? Um, yeah, there's so many. Uh, I would check out Cameron, who's a young female entrepreneur. She's amazing, runs Coloft. Um, they host a lot of stuff. Um, and she's very hooked in and she's wonderful. Uh, and she just had twins and I don't know how she manages it, but she does. And um, there's also Startup Digest. Uh, my friend Matthias uh, curates that. Um, I don't know, it's just Startup Digest LA. You can Google it and get on there and it'll, it'll show you a lot of the good events. Um, and then also I would get in with uh, Jason Nazar at DocStock. Uh, he does a lot of speaking, a lot of educational things, and yeah, 
Um, and also Amplify. I'm a mentor for Amplify. It's one of the accelerators out here and they do a lot of events. They're becoming like a very big um, central hub for the LA tech scene. Awesome. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Where can people find more information out about uh, Doc Run specifically and follow you on Twitter too? Yeah, if you, um, if anybody wants to, is interested in contracts or formula business, um, we're in private beta right now, so I suggest uh, just email me, drop me an email, uh, Jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R, at docrun.com, and I will get you taken care of. Um, and as far as, uh, what was the other question? I'm sorry. <laughs> Where can we find you on Twitter? Oh, Jen Rooting. So that's my Twitter handle, at Jen Rooting, J-E-N, and then my last name, Rooting, R-E-U-T-I-N-G. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much, and wishing you the very best of luck with Doc Run. We'll be more than happy to promote you. I definitely, I want to get on the beta to see exactly what's going on behind it. I think it's intriguing, especially with uh, considering how expensive <laughs> having a lawyer really is. So it'll be a fun experience. So anyway, again, thank you. You've been watching Young Female Entrepreneurs, the live stream that happens every Thursday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern. Make sure that you check us out on iTunes, on YouTube, and on on ovalay.tv for replays of past episodes. Next Thursday is the author of Surrey's Burn Book. She is a blogger that turned thousands, hundreds of thousands of loyal viewers into a book deal, and it's going to be amazing. So make sure that you show up next week at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern. Until then, have a fantastic week. This has been Jennifer Dono with YoungFemaleEntrepreneurs.com.